Thanks. Uh, very awkward uh, thing strapped to the side of my. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so I graduated from this school in 2002, and I'm super excited to be back in Ann Arbor um, visiting family and uh, having the opportunity to share some of the things we're up to over in Somerville, Massachusetts. So Softy Architects, this is my firm. Uh, we're 60 strong. We're in Somerville, uh, close to Cambridge, uh, outside of Boston. And um, we have offices in, our headquarters is in Somerville, but we have offices in uh, Singapore and Shanghai, in Israel and Jerusalem. And um, basically we set up site offices around projects as we, as we get big projects here and there. And so, but the practice has been around, we've had the luxury of working with a practice, um, I've had the luxury of working in a practice that's been around for over 50 years. And so this is Moshe Safdi 50 years ago. Um, this is the team that built Habitat, which most people know about in Montreal, Habitat 67. And um, so Habitat was built at a time in the 60s uh, that we've, I've been reflecting on a lot more uh, the, six, the, the kind of rise of our firm in the 60s around other visionary thinkers, utopian visionary thinkers. You guys probably all study Buckminster Fuller and are aware of some of his radical ideas of um, trying to tackle some of the problems as, as viewed from the 1960s. What would those be? They would be cities are becoming very dense. People are moving to cities. They're becoming kind of inhuman. How are we going to solve the problems of the future? And he was a radical thinker. He's thinking about like, hey, let's put a giant glass dome over New York, two miles in diameter. That's pretty crazy. And um, this was also a time of exhibition of architecture, which was at a grand scale, and I think unparalleled to date. So this is like when architecture was on the cover of Life magazine, you know, the, showing Buckminster Fuller's uh, American Pavilion in Montreal that was built side by side with Habitat. And this building is still available to go tour if, if you are in Montreal. It's been repurposed as a museum. And there was thinkers like Yona Friedman, who I'd suggest that you take a look at, who were imagining, like, how do you tackle density in the future? Uh, why not build another city on top of the city and create these kind of ideas of multiple planes of existence, the ground plane and the city plane above, gardens in the sky, and um, why are we only focusing on the ground and some of the amazing illustrations that he had created at the time. Paul Rudolph and you know um, others, and I think one of the, like I said, the exhibits that was most powerful to look at as a student for me and for students like you was Expo 67 in Montreal. There are some really, really amazing pavilions that were built as part of this expo. Um, uh, not, in, not, I mean, Moshe built, he's 26 years old, he has his thesis at McGill University, and he somehow convinced somebody to allow him to build it. So that's how Habitat happened. Um, but there was amazing other uh, experiments that actually look fairly uh, contemporary to this day. You had Fry Auto, you had Buckminster Fuller, you had amazing uh, national pavilions. Um, and the original proposal for Habitat looked like this. It was much bigger than the, than the built um, Habitat. So the original Habitat uh, had a hotel, um, it had a mix of a program. It was much larger, residential component. It had the same spirit as what was built. Um, uh, it had a, a school, it had a retail environment underneath what we call these membranes. So it was an open network of circulation above and below. You could walk freely through these sky streets. And you know this, this physical model of the original proposal kind of celebrates the idea. Um, and Habitat is built in. So this is Moshe after Habitat. If this keeps happening, I'm just going to like talk loud. Um, so you know, again, Newsweek magazine, and there was other versions of this proposal that were put out there. This is a version that was proposed for Puerto Rico, and these were all these different geometries and 
these were a way of thinking about unitizing and prefabrication and, and very common themes we talk about today. We wonder, uh, and we're approaching this today and wondering, you know, has the time come that this is actually going to be a possibility that we can create residential complexes that are completely fabricated and stacked and aggregated together on a hillside or as tower forms. This is one of my favorite ones in New York, a proposal over the FDR and the, um, you know, these kind of radical solutions to rethinking, uh, let's call it the staid uh, tower extrusion, tower typology. And, and my, one of another favorite sketch that I've pulled out of the archive is one that has a little note on the bottom right um, from 1963. It says meeting place. And this is a very different experience at street level than we have in the city today. It's very multidimensional and spatial with sky streets and membranes of stacked residential structures and streets below and public circulation above. And as a social place, it feels really contemporary and like a place that could exist today. But um, let's look at what today looks like in the majority of our dense urban centers. Um, this is a picture of Hong Kong that is not so dissimilar from many other places on the planet today where we're seeing a whole series of very tightly clustered developments, uh, tower against tower, um, like blocking light to below at street level, you know, the priorities are, are potentially not set appropriately. And I think we think um, there's a, we haven't really cracked the tower typology related to the human scale. And so we think a lot about like what the tower typology could be if we, you know, invested time in either um, rethinking it individually as the profession as architects or maybe in parallel with um, authorities like uh, governments and, and different authorities that are working on the kind of urban scale. And I have some examples of how a city skyline can be completely transformed through, um, let's say, progressive practices in places like Singapore. I'll share a couple of these examples today. Um, and, and in house, I, I want to show kind of an obsession with the rethinking of, of what it means to live in these dense urban environments, not just living, but you know, working and play. Live, work, play is um, a market slogan you see for just about any one of these developments you see in like Chicago or any big city. But you know, when you get to the final conclusion, the kind of result of these spaces, they're not really as seen on TV. They're not remarkable places to be. And, so these are some glimpses and just speculations. Um, this is, these aren't real projects. We've just been testing out different ways of thinking about, about building dense, multi-mixed-use projects. Um, and one example of a built project that I've been involved with is this is my project, Sky Habitat. Um, we did not name it. This is from the developer. Everything has to have sky in front of it. Um, and, so this is the neighborhood that we're building. This is Bishan neighborhood, which is um, in Singapore. It's filled with uh, public housing. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see all this public housing. On the left are these emerging towers that are popping up very quickly. And so we were commissioned to design 500 units uh, on a very small site. This is the site plan. And there's, we, our, our solution, our, our, our challenge was how do you fit all the amenities and luxury gardens and all the f spaces that would make this site feel comfortable and human scaled at the same time building these fairly enormous um, structures. And so if the typical typology of these towers is on the upper left hand side of the screen, our simple diagram as you move um, to the next one on the upper right would be to bridge and link these uh, buildings together to open them up on the bottom left and allow there to be passive air circulation through. And then on the right-hand side, imagining a world where the penthouse apartment, the top level, is not the only apartment that gets the benefit of a rooftop experience, but like, could you step the entire facade, the 
you know, super technology, high technology stepping um, to give everyone a garden. So it's, in our minds, pretty simplistic, but you don't see this very often. And so each of the bridges become common spaces that you can, even if you own a one bedroom apartment, you can go to these spaces and you can hang out um, on these bridges. Um, a one bedroom apartment might be like 300 square feet in Singapore, but you have you know, thousands of square feet of, of bridges. And what I said before was about these collaborations between authorities and governments. In Singapore, they actually put these incentives out there where if you create those types of gardens and void decks, the developer is incentivized to build them because they don't have to count the area contributing to the GFA, overall GFA. And th there's these relationships between these rule sets that are put out by the government. This is a, actually a sheet on the right-hand side that's on their website. It says, if you do this, you know, it's to your advantage. And so no developer would build a project or no in Singapore without these amenities um, these days. And so this is a construction photo of, of Sky Habitat with our terraces. And um, this was in 2014 and some of the bridge spaces. And we have this, these kind of playful balconies that are dancing back and forth on the facade. They're acting to shade the facade and also give, because they're kind of moving back and forth, they, they have double height, double height um, experiences, you know, so you're not like hemmed in under a single height balcony. And it really feels like you're floating in the sky in these, these amazing bridges. And of course the ground plane is a parking garage underground, so we've completely hidden it underneath a giant garden, swimming pools, and all the great things that you have in Ann Arbor too, right? So, um, as students. So you can swim from one side of this building to the other, which is really cool, on the top floor, on the 40th floor. And um, anyways, I'm gonna skip this next one because I talked too much about that previous one. Quito, we're working in Ecuador. This is a new project that I'm working on in the capital. And Quito is this really cool place. It's actually on top of a mountain, so it's already really high up in the air, and it's surrounded by these volcanoes. And um, we were approached with this super tiny site. It's only 60 feet long by 100 feet, 100 feet wide. It's right on the corner site. Um, the client calls it the corner. Um, that's the name of the project. And so on the left side is literally just the extrusion of the project. And uh, we're just, we, need to, we need to do something here because, like I said, we need to try to find a way to humanize this, this volume to give it some you know, attributes that improve the quality of life for people who are going to live here. So we, we, within the building volume, just simply shifted the building form in and out in creating a private terrace for every single unit. Um, this is the result. Uh, it was just launched two weeks ago and um, it's gonna start construction next year. So every, every terrace comes with a planter and a tree and a beautiful uh, garden. So that's, that's some glimpses into the residential work that we're doing. Um, I'm gonna jump scales. I'm gonna jump to like a much bigger scale even. Um, Another challenge of our office that we're facing is actually as a discipline, as a practice, um, you're gonna go out there and get a job and work for firms that might be tackling similar problems. This is, the, this is not our work, but this is a very typical project where you, it's a mall on the ground level and parking, and then you have these, a series of office and residential towers above. The very familiar podium tower typology and um, not in love with this at all. Um, usually they're kind of introverted. In other words, you kind of arrive to this development and it's inward focused. It's not really connected to the street or to the surrounding buildings. And so as a challenge, we're thinking about this all the time. When somebody comes with this type of building brief, how do we create, a, how do we design a reaction to this that doesn't fall into the same um, positions and so I like to talk about Marina Bay Sands as one super extra large project, mega scale project, where we um, attempted to break down the scale in a different way than the typical podium tower typology. And so 
it's, it's got a lot of challenges, this project. There is very little context to relate to. So the site in 2005 where we started the job is this green space that was all totally constructed land. It's, re, um, it's uh, reclaimed land. It's, it was originally the ocean. So the city is actually growing and the bay is a constructed urban design. And so here's, you know, uh, last year, an image of the completed project, and I'll take you through com some of the strategies of how we struggled and took on this challenge of, of creating a new part of the city while at the same time connecting it totally to the existing context and trying to find a scale that relates to the human being. And so this is the overall image of Marina Bay with the Marina Bay Sands you can see um, there uh, at the center of the screen. And all this blue um, area is actually reclaimed land. And so that's the city used to, in the city state used to stop in that gray area on the left, which is pretty remarkable. And so one of our key ideas here was actually reflecting back on like how a Roman city is developed. Roman city has like these strong spinal axis, um, the cardo and the decumanus. So, you know, we start to chop down the scale of the site by creating streets and in between these, so then in between these streets you have these volumes that are rising up, one of which becomes, um, I'll show you a site plan, theaters, a second a casino, a third a convention center, these are very large programs, and the hotel. And we're trying to weave people through these spaces in a very kind of human way by integrating indoor and outdoor and allowing the spaces to to breathe and flow out at night when it becomes more comfortable to, you know, Singaporeans go completely outside at night. And, and um, so we treat these Cardo and Decomana spine streets like the public right of way. I mean, these, of course, we align them with retail and with natural light and they become the kind of um, urban um, spaces that are connecting each of these larger volumes and very much it's important that these streets become very transparent in terms of their self-orientation. You don't really need signage. You do need signage, but in a way, it's always about creating these vistas and axes and viewpoints where you can see where you are and where you're going, connecting across really, really large spaces. And we believe in natural daylight, so like in this image, it's always important that these spaces are flooded with natural daylight and um, and then in between these spaces, you have these amazing pavilions. I mean, pavilions at a grand scale. This is the casino and the theater. And, um, and so there's also this enormous hotel tower. And so the hotel, you know, you're building big. How do you build big? We have 3,000 rooms. And um, we could have built one giant super bar building. We could have built this much taller. This building is shorter than it needs to be. But to break down the scale, we, um, I think we kind of were playing with this Portman, John Portman-like idea of bringing the public right through the center, through this kind of amazing atrium, this horizontal atrium space, but also breaking down the block of these 3,000 rooms into three towers with giant gaps in between. And then spanning this tower with this really wild idea, which is, I mean, very simple, like, you know, we positioned all the program on the site and we're saying like, okay, well, where are we gonna put all the amenities? Um, and so we have this like really like um, interesting idea of just putting it on the roof and, and spanning across as a giant bridge. So this is, you know, the cross section through the, what we call the sky park. It's um, in the spirit, I think of some of those images that I shared of these sky streets and spaces in the sky above from the 60s and onward. And thinking about how can you create spaces up in the sky that are as active as destinations, um, as places that draw you, um, and, and that are active um, civic places. I'm not sure I would call it a public place, not yet. We're still kind of playing around with the ideas. Can you truly create a public place on top of a building? But there's you know the signature swimming pool that's 150 meter long. Um, design, which I'm very proud of. I spent five years on site up on top of this building, you know, designing the final details of this space and working to coordinate to ensure the vision of the whole team. Um, 
And so there's also this wonderful garden, um, but the swimming pool gets a lot of attention. And, and uh, Martha Stewart likes him, Def Leppard. And, um, there's, we have a limited edition Lego kit, if you can get your hands on it. So it's really been accepted in, as a symbol of place, a symbol of pop culture even. It was in, it's in movies now. And um, they do their national day holiday flying their um, airplanes over the building and it's super it's a proud moment every year to see how all the people are really embracing this as part of the city um, and uh, so I'm gonna just speed up even faster um, we're playing around with some of these ideas into like the next generation of what this thing can be um, in China um, again dealing with this kind of dense urbanism we've um, recently, um, we're building this project with a Singaporean developer called the Raffles City Chongqing. It's going to have a sky park. We're calling it a conservatory because it's enclosed. It's um, going to be filled with uh, the amenities from the hotel, meeting rooms, um, restaurants, public spaces, all 70 stories in the sky. This was two weeks ago. Um, and so this is our next kind of... Um, let's say, evolution and an experiment with uh, the challenge of the mega scale. But we're playing around with this all over the place in Guangzhou. We're playing around with another iteration. This is just on the boards. In Toronto, we recently proposed a, a tower that's reminiscent. We're, we're thinking, like, is there another metric for understanding the value of a building aside from its height? You know, so, like, kind of framing this building in the middle, which is a silhouette of our proposal side by side with all these towers that are just, you know, fighting like who's the tallest, but certainly that shouldn't be the core objective of what we do here. So, and then the final project, I want to leave like a bunch of time if you guys have any questions. Um, I'm just going to race through this one. So in Singapore, again, um, we won a competition um, four years ago for something called the Jewel. Um, and it's at the center of the airport. It's, the airport is organized in Singapore, kind of like there's an airport boulevard that arrives, and it's kind of like a giant cul-de-sac that arrives at this red site, which was currently a parking lot next to the air traffic control tower. And it's an amazing experience driving to the airport or from the airport in Singapore because it's completely this landscaped experience. It's like a 20-kilometer stretch of the same banyan rain tree repeated it's a completely built landscape, and it's probably the largest constructed landscape ever made, and it terminates at the airport. And here's this opportunity to create this termination point where there's currently nothing. And so the brief had these like amazing and weird suggestions like, hey, you know, a lot of people come to the airport to have their wedding. And we're like, you're kidding me. You know? <laughs> like, and like, this happens at the airport. And like this is at the airport, and you're like, so the, because Singapore is a small place, and because this airport's so nice, and because it's air conditioned, there's a lot of these public things that happen right at the departures hall, and they also do these amazing things where they take advantage of that, and they have this program where they build these amazing gardens, and and people totally are indoor gardens, and they love them, and so the brief for this competition was. Like, give us a single space to do all these things on the land side. So land side means before you check into your flight. And so um, they said, you know, it would be really great as part of this. It's basically a mall in terms of a brief. It was a lot of retail space and food. And, but we want an attraction. And they gave us examples of like a theme park or like dinosaurs or like an aquarium. And they also said, like, maybe you could take some of the garden elements from around the other parts of Singapore and you could put it in this project. And so, um, you know, we start with a lot of sketching. These are some of Moshe's sketches from his sketchbook, and the team is working back and forth to interpret these sketches and to, like, kind of take them to, what, what, is, what, is, it, what is it saying? They're, like, diagrams. And so our entry into this competition was to say, what if we take the garden and we supersize it and we make that the attraction? And so side by side, you could have a mall and a garden that are each doing their own thing. And you don't do like 
you know, a garden themed mall or vice versa, but that you, you truly in these like hatched areas create this retail marketplace and parking and there's an IMAX theater and there's all kinds of great stuff in there. And then simultaneously you create this amazing garden. Um, can you put them side by side? Now each has its own requirements and technical criteria. And so this was our proposal. It connects all the terminals together under one enormous dome. And again, you like refer back to like, you know, the influences of, of Expo 67 and these enormous singular geometries and social spaces. And here's a plan of the project. So it's a double loaded retail circuit. And at the center is something we call the Forest Valley. And that's this amazing garden. So on the interior ring of the retail, you have all the shops that can face into the garden. And on the outside of the outside ring, you have shops facing the exterior of the airport. And this garden kind of cascades up and over like you saw in section. It's, the garden becomes the structure for all the kind of programming and amenities for the airport so they can do what they want with it, but the garden is always there. So it's not something that's gonna go away. And by night, it can be completely transformed into something. This is the view from Airport Boulevard. And as you enter into the space, this is what you'll see um, in the Forest Valley. The train, it's called the APM, was existing on site. So one of the things that was remarkably difficult is we're building this entire building around an existing connecting train line from one terminal to another. So people going from one terminal to another are gonna go into this building and see the world's tallest waterfall indoors and kind of like, what was that? And then go to the next terminal. And so, um, so anyways, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a torus or a donut shape. So it means that the low point is, it's not a dome. It's, it's so the low point allows the water when it rains, it's gonna come right into the center of the building and free fall 40 meters, 150 feet down into the center of the project. And as you arrive from the baggage claim and other parts of the airport, you grab your bags, and you walk into this kind of experience of this five level tall garden, which you can hike. So if you don't wanna do the retail circuit with the escalator business and elevators, you can walk right into the center of the garden. You can take these trails. And you can walk up the trails in the mall, completely divorced from the retail experience, but side by side with it. And so, of course, our, um, the team that we have at the office is extremely dedicated to making this all work. We have a very good group of experts that are building this in you, anywhere from starting in Rhino, moving to Revit, documenting the whole process, and I'll, I won't talk about that. These terraces are, there's a series of these terraces, different shaped terraces that overlook the spaces, the, the garden at the center. At the top of the building, there's this, additional garden, which becomes more family oriented and we're gonna have all kinds of fun stuff up there. We're working with an amazing collaborator, Atelier 10, you should look them up, they're in London and they have helped us achieve the climate response. How do you make it comfortable for people in this building while at the same time giving enough natural daylight for the plants? And, and how do we figure this out? We build a large mock-up full size and we get everyone together and we test out all of our ideas. And I said, there's a lot of attractions. There's gonna be these net walks and giant hedge maze and all kinds of fun stuff. And it, you know, Singapore, we said, okay, well, what else can we do? And so we're projecting things onto the water at night. And it's gonna be this amazing show that we're developing with a company called Wet. And so Wet, you know, they did the Bellagio fountain. So they're like really used to like this. And so this is the first time that they've done a waterfall, but um, we're having a great time with them. It falls into what will be a, a very large kind of acrylic cone. It's three inches thick. Um, it's using like uh, aquarium technology, you could say. No joints visible, no structure visible. It's just completely transparent and the water falls right into the space, bringing natural daylight into all the spaces below. And, you know, this was a fun mock-up that we did in California to test our assumptions. We built a little piece of the waterfall to make sure that it wasn't too loud or too splashy or all these concerns that you have when you build these types of things. This was last week, I was on site and um, this is the inside of the building. It's gonna open in March and uh, we're super excited about it. 
and they're just in the process of installing 3,000 trees. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just wrap it up right there. So thank you for the opportunity to share this stuff. Yeah. So um, I think it's a combination of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I <laughs> really no idea how this happened. The, like, you can, I mean, my advice would be that you put yourself out there graduating from this school or, you know, what did I, what, exactly what did I do? I, rep I met Moshe through, um, I applied to a research fellowship because I did not want to be an architect, I wanted to teach. And that came out of this being coming to this school and going to UCLA and I saw this poster for a research fellowship. Well, I didn't get that job, but then I was hired. He said, no, you're too young. I was all right. But, um, so that was, I probably was too young, but I did a lot of competitions working directly with him and uh, developed a rapport and he gave me a lot of responsibility. and. Um, uh, I had the crazy opportunity after winning the Marina Bay Sands competition to move to Singapore and learn a lot from the perspective, not of the, you know, how do you put together an amazing presentation of an idea, like how do you actually carry that out? And so that was a transformation in terms of understanding how you work with big groups of people to make things happen. And so like I say, that like the, the design side is, all, is kind of easy, I think the people side is the hard part of our profession. Um, I, I think you figure that out after school, unfortunately, um, because you're like right in it and you, you kind of find your way of how to work with people. You're not sitting at your desk singularly conceiving an idea anymore. You're working with 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people on an idea. And you, and my advice is just to kind of get into these experiences and look around and see how other people are working with groups of people. And I think that's what I did. I just looked around a lot and I, I, I saw and got a lot of experience by just watching and listening and seeing how other people tackle big problems. And then I'm standing here uh, today. So I, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of luck. There's, you know, if we didn't win certain competitions, maybe I wouldn't be working on big projects um, and as you meet people, they always connect you to the next thing. So I would say that two thirds of the work that I shared just now is all connected to the first entry we had in Singapore. So Marina Bay Sands happens, you meet some person and then it connects to the next thing and the next thing. Hey, I like you, let's work together. So it's really about people. And of course you have to prove yourself when you're sitting there and you conceive of a design and you don't win a competition they're not, you know, but we've been very lucky to be selected for a lot of projects through competition and through direct commission. And uh, I think that's, yeah. 